Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the Comox Valley Regional District regular board meeting of March 15th to order. Second. <laughs> not, <laughs> not there yet. <laughs> for, for, <laughs> that's quite funny. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. And uh, we've been educating ourselves on the contents of the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People. And tonight we have the final article um, from UNDRIP to read for you. And that is Article 46.3. The provisions set forth in the Declaration shall be interpreted in accordance with the principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, equality, non-discrimination, good governance, and good faith. And with that, we move on to petitions and delegations. And today we have the Anderson Therapeutic Garden Society. Um, presenters are Jackie Holt, it, who is the president. Um, and I think that is it. Um, and if you'd like to come to the mics over here. Thank you. Welcome. And you have 10 minutes to present and then if you're amenable, we might have some questions for you. Can I confirm that the, uh, the person who I gave my um, presentation to, it's in place? Yeah. Just, just bringing it up. Thank you. Okay. We won't start the clock on you just yet. If, okay. May I speak before the clock starts? I would just like to say thank you for yes, inviting me here today on behalf of Anderton Therapeutic Garden Society. And uh, has the, tell me when the clock starts. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, we often say that a picture can paint a thousand words and probably more than anything, a garden is going to be able to do that. So I'm going to tell you about the Anderton Therapeutic Garden Society, which operates the gardens on Anderton. But I'm also going to tell you about a challenge that we have. So how do I change the slide? This? Yeah. Okay. Uh, our origins. During the past 25 years, the gardens on Anderton has developed from a two acre cow pasture into a vibrant community amenity, offering gardens and gardening experiences for people of all ages and abilities to enjoy. And that's a shot of the gardens in the height of summer. My purpose today, as the current president of Anderton Therapeutic Garden Society, I need to inform local politicians about the services that we offer to our valley-wide community. We have only five years left in our lease with the Anderton Nurseries, and we do not want to risk losing all of that we have created in 25 years of volunteer effort, the hard work and commitment to the community and to the environment. And that's a shot of our sunny courtyard. What do we do? We're a therapy garden. Oh boy, I've got this in right. I can't read that far away, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, yeah, got it. Okay. Um, okay, what do we do? A therapy garden. Our original goal is to provide a therapeutic garden environment for people of all ages and abilities. The first significant development was of the loop, the only one of its kind open to the public in the area then and now. The loop provides a secure walking area for people who have cognitive impairments. Surrounded by flowers and shrubs and enclosed in a picnic area, local residents from various facilities can enjoy the calm safety of this area. Therapy can be found in many activities, including a meditation garden, a labyrinth, a children's garden, and a reflecting pond. Our 46 allotments are an important opportunity for therapy for people who grow fruits, vegetables, and flowers. 
This is a hub of commitment to the local food security, working in the earth for a valuable and rewarding way. And this is a series of shots of the gardens at our labyrinth. This is our allotment area, our pond, a place to find peace. And this is the loop, a place for safe wandering for people who may have cognitive impairments that cause them to go wandering. And this is our children's garden, just introduced last year. And a couple of little, little ones came over and uh, they're trying the lettuce. We grow vegetables for them to taste right there. This is a yoga class that's held in our large lawn. Our activities. We create a welcoming garden experience offering all manner of activities for young families seniors and people getting married, wanting to play live music or getting their hands into the dirt, growing flowers by tending a garden bed, and people just wanting to sit and enjoy watching for our resident eagles, picnics for families and birthday parties for young and old. We also accommodate meetings of local photography, book and service clubs, knitting groups, art groups and shows, yoga groups. The list is only restricted by the vision that members of our community would want to explore. Our activities, we create a welcoming garden experience. I'm sorry, <laughs> I think I've, I've read that before. Okay, this is a series of shots or things that we do that we consider them, they're going to be therapeutic depending upon what people do. Notice the teddy bears with the children from the local school district. And then this is in the shade when we had music and so much heat that we managed to get about 150 people in all told. Children getting dressed up. We grow lots of things. We grow flowers, shrubs, and trees. The gardens occupy a two acre outdoor space, yet we do have a number of outbuildings, including a kitchen, an office, cottage, a tool cottage, and a garden cottage, and the gift shop cottage, and the rotary stage, which features about 20 outdoor concerts each season a covered lawn area in front of the stage, and we do have public toilets, including a wheelchair accessible one. That is uh, inviting you to smell the wisteria. It's beautiful in season. Our rhodoberm, roses, water lilies and goldfish in the pond, apple blossoms, and the magic of trees. And we've got lots and lots of trees. And then what we have on the property, we've got, a the, as I said, we've got the kitchen garden and all of the different amenities. And I'll show you some quick shots of that. That's the, uh, the little gift shop that we have. It's obviously closed at the moment. And then this is the kitchen. And this is the tool sheds that we have as well. We also have 46 community allotments and then over the, over the years, the demand for the allotments has increased tremendously. As people develop their interest in growing their own fruit and veggies and yet live in stratas or apartment settings, they need to feel the earth and the glory of tasting their own grown food. We have reached our maximum of spaces for allotments with an addition of three new ones in 2022. How did we accomplish this? Our volunteers, of course. We have 260 members as of March 2022, and our memberships doubled during COVID. Over 50% of our members 
become volunteers conducting a myriad duties and tasks that keep the gardens running. Volunteers tend beds, offer service in our garden themed gift shop, plan and support the bookings and events, and are hosts to 5,000 plus visitors who visit each year, or keep our lawns mowed and tidy and keep our buildings in good repair. The recent snowfall devastated several of our established trees. And these are some shots of some of our volunteers making bouquets, walking the labyrinth, chopping down trees. And this is some shots of the trees that, one tree that we've had to take out. Our numbers have gone up since 2015. Annual number of visits to the garden has doubled to over 5,000. And this excludes children. We're going to continue counting children this year. Our membership has doubled. And then during 2021, we had 125 separate bookings for various groups. Most of our visitors come from the Comox Valley or Campbell River. Pretty well everybody uh, is from a, a homegrown and local uh, community. We calculate that all of this is accomplished with over 15,000 volunteer hours each year. So what's really important is our challenge. Anderton Nurseries is a 38.5 acre in ALR land and it's up for sale. Given that it has taken 25 years for us to accomplish the gardens and its infrastructure, we do not want the, lose, the community to lose this amenity. A new owner may not wish to renew our lease. If we have to leave our current location, our community would forfeit a great asset. We need local politicians to know this. We wonder. Dare we offer a potential opportunity for our valley? The development of a garden farm park, bringing many agencies together to use this property in a unique way, including educational opportunities for the school board and North Island College, expanded allotment areas for many local families, micro farms for young people to get to the dirt, and forging partnerships of collaboration, cooperation, and mutual support for many community nonprofits who could legitimately use ALR land to fulfill their mandate. Okay, just to let you know, you have a minute left. Okay, I think I've got some more shots. Thank you very much for inviting me. I hope you'll come and smell the roses and flowers sometime. And more than anything, the message that I want you all to hear is we need a timely survival strategy for the gardens. Thank you very much for your time. And I would be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I could see how effective the therapeutic garden can be because just the pictures make me feel calmer. So <laughs> I do have membership forms with me if you want okay. to. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Director Arbor. Thanks. That's great. And, and indeed, it was a nice journey to, uh, to the gardens through your presentation. Um, and it made me think because we just, on Horby Island, we just signed uh, maybe four years ago a 20 year. 25 year lease for a community garden yeah. on six acres. And um, and the years will by, and I'm sure those 20 or 25 years will will come to term at some point. That's right. Um, we were trying to negotiate 99 years, but anyways, when you're on the lease situation. So um, so I guess I there's been no covenant or anything like that explored with the current owner to try to secure the uh, the gardens into the future. We have uh, tried to explore even just extending the lease, let alone the covenant. And it's not been, uh, they, they are not interested in that. They do not want to compromise the sale of the whole property, the 38 acres, because of our tiny two acres. And in part that is because of the access road. There is only one access road onto that property. It's a big piece, but it's got a, a panhandle that comes from Anderton Road and then out onto the 38 acres. I have no idea as to what it's like out there. I mean, it's just beyond what we do. 
Thank you. I, I, I'm pretty sure we don't have a garden farm park at the regional district, but uh, if that can be explored, that would definitely be the place to do it. That would be, that's music to my ears. Thank you. Director Hamir. I love that Director Arbor just said that, because you know who has a garden farm park? Nanaimo Regional District. So oh. it's not out of the, uh, the, the conception, right? So um, thank you, first of all, for bringing you know, the, the park to the board. I've had the, the wonderful opportunity of visiting um, Anderton Gardens a few times. So if, if um, directors around the table haven't been there, it's, it really is a gem. Um, one of the things you didn't cover is how you pay for all of this activity. I mean, that's not, you said 150, you know, 15,000 hours of volunteer time, but on top of that, there must be many material costs to run the garden. So how do you do that? There are. It costs us about between twenty and thirty thousand dollars a year to operate, and the majority of money uh, comes in. It trickles. It comes in from memberships. Uh, we do rent uh, the property uh, for the various activities. Uh, you know, so we we uh, um, you know if somebody wants to have a wedding or a musical concert, we charge just two hundred dollars for them to be able to use the space. Um, and then we do ask uh, people if they would be honourable enough to pay, to give us the four dollars it costs to come in. But it is that is not a barrier. We do not want cost to be a barrier. So if people can't afford to come in, or certainly when a bunch of school children come in, they all just come in for free. So. We uh, and we we do receive a grant. Um, we we've been very very kindly given a grant from the CVRD uh, for a number of years, and so that helps uh, us along. Um, and then we just uh, we just keep on. We write for grants, and do those different things. But uh, we are solely volunteer funded. Uh, we applied to get some uh, funds for a student for this summer uh, for, with the Canada student uh, program. But if we don't get it, we don't we don't hire. We, we don't have that kind of money. It's literally all of us. Thank you. Thank you. If I could ask one more question. Um, I, you, you noted some of the features that um, are on in, in the garden, the loop especially. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can comment as to like how many gardens um, in the valley or close by are suited specifically for, for cognitive um, disability. Um, are you aware of any other sites that are like this? I am not aware of any. We are the sole place that has a loop which allows people to come and uh, and be, they, they don't feel enclosed because it's just a, an ordinary gate. And if you saw in the photograph, it's got a metal barrier, but the, the plants grow up, so they create a natural barrier. And people with cognitive disabilities, they don't perceive that they want to walk through it or anything like that. So we are the only one and we do have uh, visits from uh, from Seniors Village, um, The Views, St. Joe's um, and numerous places uh, in, the, in, the, in the valley that do have uh, people who are experiencing dementia uh, type symptoms. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Hillian. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, I just want to be really clear about what you're asking. Um, is it uh, that the regional district actually purchased the site? <laughs> is that what you're asking? Well, I'm, I'm not. That would be an insult. I, that, that's not what I'm asking. But I, I, we've always felt that it was really important that that. Politicians in our community need to know what we've been doing rather silently for the last 25 years. Um, and that is why I wanted to come today, because we know that we're going to have to do something. If, if you were to get in touch with me and say, we've decided to buy it, you know who's going to be the happiest person in the valley immediately. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not without um, business acumen and understanding of how finances work. But I would like to have the support of the CVRD and each of the individual municipalities in, in searching how do we get our way through this dilemma. It is 
a dilemma. And I would hate to think that um, in five years or in this next five years, it's sold. The people who buy it choose to basically close us down. Like just say, no, we, we're, we're gonna build a big house and we're just gonna make that garden our garden. I would hate to see that because it would affect so many sectors of our community. So to answer your question with a bit of cogency, it would be that I want you to know the challenge and I want you to be able to help us deal with that challenge. And if a farm, um, a farm garden park would be something that you could be thinking about, the gardens on Anderton would be absolutely there wanting to um, be part of it, but we couldn't begin to afford it and we don't know how and where and where to go you're the first group of people that we have publicly proclaimed that we need your help or what was my final thing we need a timely survival strategy well thanks for clarifying that i, I did look it up and the asking price is 3.4 million oh um which is pretty significant uh, wow. uh so I guess I'm not entirely clear of what we could do to create a farm garden park um, other than uh, you know, purchase the site, which may or may not be an option. I somehow doubt it. Um, but I, I'm just wondering, uh, so that the sense is that it, it will be sold. Uh, some entity or individual will purchase it. And your concern is that they may not feel um, that this is worth keeping open because they have some other purpose for the land. Uh, um, when I've spoken with uh, Ellen Presley, who's uh, the uh, part owner of uh, Anderton Nurseries, who we've got a very good relationship with, um, she has said that they have, uh, as they've selected their realtors, they're, they're making sure that they understand the importance of the gardens and, and as it is to the community. Um, but all I can say, and I love the fact that she's behind us and the realtor's behind us, but that doesn't change the, the reality if, if somebody comes along with, uh, with a, a, you know, a, enough money to make an, an offer that Ellen and Carl would accept, that they would then accept having us there. The goodwill may not follow the, when the money is there. Lots of goodwill is easy to talk about, but not when, it, when, when things uh, get put in place. And um, I, I wanted you each individually um, to know about the gardens. I wanted you to hear me. I wanted you to see me. And I want you to know me because um, I, I, it's like the beginning of what we're going to have to do. And we've got five years and it it's taken 25 years to get it to that. We can't, even if you said we've got a spare piece of land and the CVRD will give it to us, it would take us five years to be able to develop it even now to accommodate that. So, I mean, you, you can see how we as a board, we'd literally sit around and talk about this and it's the what if, what if, what if, what if. But for me, it was as the president, I can't sit around and talk about what ifs anymore. I need a bunch of people in this community to know what we do, what we're, what we're dealing with. And then each of you then becomes maybe somebody who you, you never know. You may have an idea. Things may crop up. Something may happen. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Next, we have Director Greve. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Jack, you're really pulling at my heartstrings here because uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I grew up on the farm just down the road from Anderton. Really? Yeah, the one with the White House in it. Oh, yeah. That's where I grew up. And we used to go um, at, in the back there and skate on the, on the pond when it got cold enough, which was about every three years, got cold enough to skate. Yes. But we were, the, uh, at the time, it was a chicken farm, and uh, old man Hicks ran it, and uh, he wasn't very popular with our family. I think he shot two of our dogs for chasing chickens. But, you know, when my dad sold it, I think he sold it for uh, about $9,000. So too bad we didn't hold on to it. Wish you had. <laughs> In hindsight. But um, certainly I think, you know, you're, doing, you're on the right track. You're trying to raise the level of awareness here and, and make people realize what a great attribute it is to the community. And uh, maybe it'll start some kind of fundraising activity that, that will... Uh, 
and, and look on the good side. Maybe you'll find a benevolent buyer that uh, is only too happy to have it continue. So, you know, anyway, I just want to thank you all for coming out and, and, uh, and making this this uh, this plea in in front of all of us and and our friends in the cyberland out there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Is it at all possible that a member of the CVRD staff would be in any way able to work with us to to start to formulate how or what or if a development occurs? Is it? Can we do that or do we do I come back and speak to you as a council again? So at the next meeting, if well, one of the directors is so inclined, they could request some information um, from staff as to um, what might be possible as far as working with your group. And we do have a, a regional park service investigation happening right now. So um, oh, okay. that might be able to be referred to that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And thanks so much for this. I, I would echo what the Chair said. It was profoundly relaxing just to, <laughs> just to visit vicariously through the, the, uh, the photographs. You obviously have a really positive relationship with the current owner of the land. And we do. Obviously, the great security of tenure you've had for all those years. Have you discussed at all with them the possibility of them perhaps placing some sort of covenant on the land such that uh, any buyer would need to maintain the garden and ensure that it was not evicted from the property. And perhaps they might want some compensation for putting a covenant like that on, but it might be a more affordable way of securing the land uh, simply um, rather than actually outright purchasing it. Well, we haven't. Um, but it's the first time that I've heard the word covenant used. We did approach the owners um, about two and a half years ago, uh, asking if we could have an extension of the lease um, so that we could uh, at least know that we were safe if they sold. And they did not even agree to that. Um, so um, I can certainly bring that word up um, and we can talk about it with our, uh, we have a wonderful volunteer lawyer that uh, we can ask him what he thinks. But um, I know more than anything, um, Ellen and Carl want to sell and I'm not sure that anything that would in any way um, kind of hold back the sale in any way, they would be willing to. And given that we only pay them a dollar a year, we've only actually paid them $25 for the privilege <laughs> of having that beautiful piece of property, but it was a cow pasture. So you can see, yeah. you know, what, what's gone into it. But thank you. Um, you know, again, the, the other gentleman mentioned that and it's, it's, it's worth us at least seeing what we can do. I think that given, I mean, the fact that they charge you only a dollar a year, you could offer to double it and see if that would help them <laughs> change their mind. But it, it makes me think that uh, it's that some possibility of a, a of a covenant or a, a long term extension the lease might be possible. So perhaps talk to that uh, right. lawyer you have on your board and see oh. if, if anything comes to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have Director Moore next. Great, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for the presentation. I was, like many others, just really uh, feeling the emotion of that site. I haven't been there in many, many, many years and had no idea. Um, I used to bring kids from the Boys and Girls Club there many years ago. Um, I had no idea how it had expanded. Um, and it's interesting when you talked about who was using the site and as far away as Campbell River, uh, you know, it makes me think of, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have community gardens on uh, particularly the west side of Courtney, um, you know, sprinkled around some school sites <clears throat> outside of that area. But I was curious whether many people from even East Courtney or if you have folks coming from that area and then also the piece around so many people in stratas or apartment buildings accessing because I've brought this up numerous times at Courtney Council as we're um, as we're developing making sure that there are places to grow food and, and other things um, because many people do move into those apartments um, 
at many ages, but often as seniors and they're used to having their own garden and now they don't have a place for it. So, you know, I see that there's a lot of benefits and particularly being on that, that part of the Comox Valley. Um, and, you know, maybe exploring some of these ideas around, you know, a charitable donation of a piece of that, that the buyer or could maybe, you know, get something back for or whatever, but um, are you able, to, do you have enough of a breakdown to say whether you have many people from East Courtney accessing that site or? We could look into the, we have to identify, we, we don't identify people by where they come right, from beyond right. their address goes into our database. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd have to identify what's, you know, east and west and that. But we we certainly know lots of people drive across, you know, they, they drive up from Royston or they drive from Black Creek right. or they drive, you know, from Cumberland or they just drive down the road like I do because I live in a strata. Mm -hmm. um, so we we just have that feeling that we're we're serving a whole lot of people. People, mm -hmm. And certainly a lot of people in the strata, um, you know, or in who live in apartments or strata type situations. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't we don't have hard data, but all you have to do is ask for it and mm -hmm. I'll get it for you. No, it's just we are getting a lot of development now, multi yeah. uh, multifamily in that in that area. Not that I'm um, proposing people driving from West Courtney over, but I mean, it is po possibly filling a need in, in on that side of the river. So thank you so much again for the presentation. Thank you very much. If I may just tell you one tiny story. We have um, uh, a couple who now live in Berwick, and so they're very, very advanced in age, uh, but they still want to garden. So you can get a sense of that. And what they want to garden is in a raised bed. So it's about this high and they're growing flowers so that they can take them to Berwick to make posies to put on the dining tables so that there is always fresh flowers on the dining tables. And that is two people who have been dedicated to this valley and its garden culture for many, many years. And we do it. We're doing it with people in their 90s. We've got an age range of people from 23 years old to mid 90s. So, again, I didn't mix. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. I think we have one more question. Dr. Vermeer. Thanks, Chair. And uh, Jackie, thanks again. Um, I don't think it can be stressed enough how much of an impact that the gardens are making on the entire community. And now that you know you've uh, you've put it out to the world that this is your the issue, um, I'm hearing some solutions that are coming from this table in terms of a covenant. But um, it also sounds like there's a possibility of um, this community has really risen to um, help support and purchase important pieces of land. I'm thinking Maclang, um, Kuskusam. Um, I think you know once. Once word gets out that this is um, important and it's at risk, um, I think you will probably be seeing many people come out of the woodwork to support. Um, not to say that maybe um, our staff don't have um, some resources to support you with. I'd be very willing um, in the next round to put forward, a, you know, a staff mm -hmm. ask staff to to put a report together on what we can do to support you. Um, and as was mentioned, we do have a regional parks um, strategy coming up too. So I just wanna point that out as well. Um, so a few strategies and hopefully we can come up with something, even maybe a hybrid of all three that um, would help support the gardens, but thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to you all. I really appreciate uh, your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're on receipts. All in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? That's carried. Enjoy your evening. We move on to reports. First, we have the Comox Valley Emergency Program Administrative Committee minutes from February 3rd. Thank you. Any further discussion on those minutes? Okay, all in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? <laughs> That's carried. So item two, electoral area service committee minutes from March 7th. Amir and McCollum, thank you. 
And any further discussion on those minutes? Okay, all in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? That is carried unanimously. We're on to item three. It's the community groups and grants funding follow up. Cole Hamilton and Grant, thank you. And I will pass it to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Jake Martins is here, General Manager of Corporate Services, to uh, describe this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Russell, and through the chair. Uh, yes, this report uh, serves as a follow up to the February 17th staff report, which was considered at the March 8th special meeting. Uh, it concerns three financial requests that come from the Comox Valley Community Health Network, the Comox Valley Social Planning Council, and the or Society, and the Comox Valley Food Policy Council. Uh, the report outlined uh, the challenges respecting the provision of ongoing funding uh, from the the general government and administrative function. Um, but in response, the boards did seek direction or further information on uh, opportunities to provide funding in 2022. Uh, the report recommends grants uh, funded by requisition for the three requesting nonprofit groups. And it also recommends an allocation uh, out of the regional feasibility studies to conduct a preliminary investigation into a regional service for social initiatives. Um, it's a brief report uh, with those two recommendations and please answer any questions in that regard. Okay. Director Kamir, go ahead. Not really a question, but just a comment. Uh, thanks to staff for being able to accommodate the um, all of the comments that I think came forward during the last discussion. I think the equity of, of funding um, these regionally impactful um, groups was, was brought up. And so I appreciate staff finding um, a, a source of funding where all communities are contributing um, is, is, uh, is great. And I would also support the, um, the feasibility um, study to look at how we can in the future support more of these groups in a, on a long-term basis. Thank you, Dr. Grave. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, and I've been receiving some, you know, correspondence regarding the, the dissolution of the warming center. And uh, I guess the inference is that uh, the regional district's sort of getting the blame for it. But, you know, in the past, um, my question is, um, are we lacking the usual funding from the province that seems to come down the pipe every so often for for these, uh, these initiatives? Um, you know, because I think that's the only way we can do it if we don't establish an actual living, breathing service for, for these social issues. You know, we're working off the side of your desk here. This is all from function 110 and 119. So it's, you know, it, it's not really designed for this purpose. We're just trying to come up with some scratch to keep it going. So, um, you know, traditionally the, the model has been that the province funds certain initiatives so is it just that the province isn't isn't uh, at this point in time uh, coming through with some extra dollars is there anything outstanding that might be coming through in the future through the chair i can't speak to the the former uh funding provision by the province to these individual groups uh but certainly the board is drawing on its general corporate power to provide uh, assistance uh to benefit the community overall. So um, it's fairly broad. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, there's not been a change in provincial funding to these groups, so at least of recent. Uh, I think they've uh, undertake as part of their um, annual activities, uh, fundraising activities, trying to support their operations. So I suspect this is part of their normal um, attempts to just secure base funding to support their administration. I think James would like to add. If I could, sure. Um, I think that's, that's uh, one of the real drivers behind the feasibility study is to understand what role does local government have to play in the in the sphere around social support services and being able to clarify where where funding opportunities are where the where the roles are are clear for whether it be local government provincial federal um, community organizations so that that's the real driver behind the feasibility work so that we can answer some of those questions that you're identifying thank you director arbor yeah, it's, um, I, I think uh, Alan Nielsen has been doing the rounds to the to ourselves and the municipalities last few days. Hopefully you've all seen him or you will see him soon. Um, but not unlike the work that was produced by staff and him on the regional part, um, 
be great if the um, or I assume the school the feasibility study will would explore how other regional district or local government have more effectively organized around this. I mean, we've seen uh, the province operates by grants, right? So that that's nothing new. Um, and sometimes they have new ministry. Now they have Ministry of Mental Health the last couple of years. Liberals come in, maybe it'll be gone overnight. So I don't think we'll ever see like stable funding in the social space from government. And that's that's whole tension where half the province of our colleagues refuse to work in the social space because that's provincial jurisdiction. So on that basis, I don't know how the province will come up with schemes that feel more permanent than what we have around grants. But if we can create a vehicle that is can capture a lot of the things that we see in the community and then, you know, shift a little bit over the years um, and also understand, yeah, what are the successes that, that some of the larger regional district or municipalities create some vehicles that seem to be more effective in uh, driving social services through local government. So yeah, I'm totally in favor of doing that feasibility. Uh, our first meeting of the board, I think um, we had at least Director Grieve and maybe Chair Kettler, and, but that's four years ago. They're like, we, we need a social planner. So we're still going on about that, <laughs> right? We recognize there's a need, there's a role for local government, but we haven't, you know, we've been just like the government. We've been very kind of more grant focused. So I am supportive of us looking at the long term and saying those problems are not going away anytime soon. Thank you, Director Hamir. I, I just wanted to bring up since it was asked, like where what what has happened um, recently that groups are are coming to to local government. I don't think we can underestimate the impact that the crash in um, gaming grants had on on our local groups. And so, um, you know, Director Arper, I think hit it right on the head that um, we're, we're offering some stability. Um, that allows um, many of these groups to leverage even five to ten thousand dollars into much more um, when um, often grants ask for it for in kind or you know some sort of, of leverage dollars and those dollars can be leveraged over and over um, with other grants so I foresee even a small investment in some of our community groups um, having a, a much bigger impact but the fact that we as local government can give that, um, stable, um, long-term funding is what many of these groups are, are asking for. Thanks. Thank you. I don't see any further lights, so we are on receipt. All in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? That's carried. Grieve and Arbor have moved recommendation one. Any further discussion? Okay, it's a vote of full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. Grant and Hamir have moved recommendation two. Any further discussion? And Director Moore? Great, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to get a bit more information about um, what, what is encompassed by this proposed feasibility study. Um, social planning is so broad. So as an example, I, I was in conversation with a social planner from New West um, recently, and um, which is about the same size of, as the Comox Valley as a whole. Um, and, you know, they have two or three different initiatives under that umbrella. Now this, this is a municipality um, and they have a housing um, you know, kind of a housing segment. And, and I think they have something to do with um, kind of a substance use piece as well. I guess when I'm looking at, at us regionally, we don't really fit into that um, kind of category because as, you know, as we know, Courtney is, is often has the more visible social problems, not that we know that all the other areas have, have their own, but we have more of the, the downtown core per se. I guess I'm curious what we're hoping to achieve with this because there are so many different issues and different priorities throughout the region. And, um, you know, Comox has an idea of what might be helpful to them. And we have our own idea in Courtney. Um, I guess I'm wondering, I mean, I know it says feasibility, but is that feasibility a study 
going to look at all those kind of um, broad areas, what would work best for the region, because I just don't see that we're going to find something that's going to satisfy the region. Um, so if I could get a bit more clarity on uh, what the scope of that feasibility study would be, that would be great. Thanks. Thanks, and through the chair. Uh, yeah, so services are generally established after a formal feasibility study, which really looks to define all the elements of the service. And, and most importantly, maybe is, it, is establishing that very clear purpose of what the service is established to do. Um, so in this case, I, I see the feasibility or the preliminary feasibility study, again, outlining the roles for local government in the social service realm, uh, the scope of social initiatives that are, that are occurring locally, the previous experience, and as James mentioned, uh, best practices or, or experiences from elsewhere around the province. And uh, in my view, that sets us up well for, as the report notes to, for the board in 2023 to consider whether they wish to identify this as a strategic priority and whether there is a need then for a more fulsome feasibility study to hone in on that purpose and the other elements that would need to be established as part of that service establishment process. So um, I hope that provides a little bit more detail, but uh, um, I think the most important uh, value of this would be to outline the considerations for the board and whether they wish to then take a further step forward with this in 2023. Thanks, Jake. Thank you. Don't see any further questions. So it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're on to item four. Four, which is the Comox Valley Transit Infrastructure Study. Grant and Armour, thank you. Now pass it to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Mike Zabarski is joining us online and uh, he will outline this report and be available to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Through the uh, chair, I'm going to share my screen and have a PowerPoint presentation up in one second. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully you can see it all and hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, thanks. Um, so it's been a little while since we talked about this, but um, just a little bit of a refresher on, on this project. Uh, this was really looking at our, at our transit infrastructure and kind of understanding the needs in the transit exchanges and transit priority measures that we would like to have. Uh, these are all kind of key pieces in our transit system, not only for kind of improving the transit efficiency, but also improving the customer experience and, and hopefully attracting uh, new riders to the system. We presented the draft uh, study back in May of last year to the board for receipt, and we got some direction at that time to present to the municipal councils for feedback. Uh, as of recently, we've now heard back from all, all councils and they've all supported the location and concepts of the proposed transit infrastructure within their jurisdictions. Uh, the City of Courtney Council did request a couple of minor amendments to the implementation plan and priorities, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. And so at this point, we're looking to get um, final, the final report endorsed by the board so that we can pursue some grant funding opportunities uh, pri primarily the inf Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. And one key point that I kind of wanted to highlight here is since, since, this, since this transit infrastructure study done, was done last year, we did the mobility primer work, as you may recall. And one of the key findings in that report was that high quality alternatives to the private automobile are, are necessary if we want to see a, a mode shift towards these sustainable modes. So high quality infrastructure is kind of a key thing within the transit service to do that. Uh, when we're talking about transit exchanges, uh, we're talking about a, a piece of infrastructure that allows the buses to connect with each other and potentially to connect with other modes. When we're talking about transit priority measures, we're talking about infrastructure that allows uh, transit vehicles to have priority over other vehicles and to get through uh, more quickly. The exchanges that we identified in the study are shown on the map here. And just a bit more on transit priority. So there, there's a range of things that we were looking at. Uh, primarily, we focus kind of on the, the left side of that level of intervention uh, spectrum there. So coordinated signals, signal preemption, and queue jumper lanes 
maybe in the longer term, we might be looking at, at bus lanes. Those are, are identified in, in this study. Uh, and you can see in the bottom left, uh, a map showing kind of the location of some of this proposed infrastructure. And on the right side is just a kind of an illustration showing how the Q jumpers work, which is the most immediate um, piece of infrastructure we're looking at from a transit priority perspective. Oops. Um, so the city of Courtney's um, response to our, our uh, delegation and presentation to council was to request um, some additions and some modifications of the priorities. So on the left side, you, you can see a number of locations where they've requested signal coordination. So what this does is it really times the, the traffic signals that to allow the buses to kind of keep flowing. So rather than a bus getting stuck in, in traffic at a stop light, it would there would be a green uh, light as it approaches and, and it would keep moving. And then on the right is uh, some of the queue jumpers that we had identified in our, in our study um, and subsequently have been updated by the city of Courtney as part of the, um, the work that they're doing with the Fifth Street Bridge rehabilitation project now complete and, and returning the, the line work uh, on the roads back to uh, pre-existing conditions. They're, they're kind of setting it up for these queue jumper lanes so that eventually it would look like the, uh, the images shown on the right here, top uh, one being at Comox Ave and uh, just on the other side of the bridge. And then the other one being at the bottom of Ryan Road as it turns left on the Old Island Highway there at Lewis Park. And these would allow the buses to kind of jump ahead of traffic on, on the green light. So the implementation plan, this is the one that's in, in the study. Uh, the changes that the city of Courtney has requested are kind of shown here. So moving the Old Island Highway, Comox Road, Q-Jump up into the short-term priorities and adding the signal coordination. So advancing these projects looks as follows. So assuming the board uh, supports this final study, we would work with BC Transit on the funding applications uh, that would happen this year. And subject to funding approval, we would come back to the board, come back to the councils and, and provide a bit of an update on, on where the projects are at and kind of the detailed next steps and financial impacts. At that point, uh, we'd be looking to enter into project agreements on, on each, each uh, piece of infrastructure. Um, this would be between CBRD, BC Transit and the municipality where it's located. This is something that would hopefully be happening next year. These project agreements would get into the details of how we would deliver the projects, uh, how we would deal with design and construction, um, the consultation and engagement requirements, requirements, how we deal with the costs and the O&M, operations and maintenance kind of responsibilities. Also next year, we'd be hoping to undertake the detailed designs and tender the projects for construction. Um, and then depending on when, when that actually happens, uh, wrapping them up. Uh, construction-wise in, in 2024. Uh, the rough estimate of kind of an annual cost to CBRD for all of the infrastructure that's listed in, in this study is about $125,000 per year. And that would occur over the life of that infrastructure, which is about 12 years, at which point those kind of debts would be retired. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, we have a question from Director Erber. Thanks, so uh, the assumption in your presentation, Mike, is these are still the same grants we were discussing in the summer, which are 80% grants, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, um, and what wasn't clear in the report is whether short all the short-term projects identified, including moving the queue jumps, are the ones we would submit for ICIP? or only some of them? Uh, our intention would be to submit them all, not just the short term, but potentially even some of the medium term. Great, okay, so that's great. That's great to know. That was my main question, because I was wondering when you were talking about the queue jumps, what the big topic we had last summer was the courthouse, right? <laughs> Moving the, uh, the interchange, but you were gonna do some more thinking around that and feedback from Courtney. Is that still the intent to look at moving the downtown? exchange yep. to buy the courthouse from uh, the museum? That's correct, yeah. So the preferred location for the downtown exchange was uh, was on England uh, at 8th between the old thrifties and, and the courthouse. 
Okay, so we have South Courtney, we've got the courthouse, you've got your queue jumps. Not in the application would be leaving Comox and Cumberland for the longer term? Uh, no, sorry, we, we would include those in the application as, oh, as well. Oh, those go in as well? Uh, okay. Well, okay. Yeah, I'll just jump back to this this slide here. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, so I, I, what, I, what I meant is we would try to include all projects, probably with the exception of the, um, the bus lanes, but all of the exchanges and all of the transit priority measures would be submitted as a package of, of projects under under the funding program. So even though you have it, sorry, Madam Chair, uh, uh, even though you have, have it under long term, the downtown Comox transit exchange would be on, in the best. So that's that's awesome. So you basically that's, that's going, the hope. you're going for broke. That's awesome. So I'm I'm very supportive. Thanks. Any further questions? Okay, we're on receipt. All in favor of receipt. Anyone opposed? That's carried. Julian and Grant have moved recommendation. Any further discussion? And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. We're on to item five, which is Economic Recovery Task Force final report. Grant and Arbor, thank you. I'll pass it to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Lisa Kilpatrick is here to present this report and answer your questions. Good evening. Through the chair to the directors, I'm here today to present the report on behalf of the Economic Recovery Task Force Steering Committee. So this report summarizes the activities of the ERTF over the last couple of years and highlights the uh, activities of the local governments in actioning on the recommendations from the business community and also highlights the tangible results. The ERTF has concluded now their work and they did so in recognizing that the local governments continue to address emerging issues arising from the pandemic. The ERTF also wishes to impress the importance of continued engagement and the value that came from engaging the business community over the past couple of years and really stresses the importance of, do, of, of continuing to do this into the future. Uh, there could be different mechanisms, whether that is uh, through the elected officials forum or through the ad hoc economic uh, issues, or what did we say, the, the addressing of economic issues in an ad hoc, ad hoc manner arising from the service review. So staff are presenting this report with the recommendation that the board concur uh, the outcome of the ERTF and conclude the work of that committee. Great, thanks, Lisa. Director Hillian, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to staff for the report. I'm just wondering if uh, there was any type of survey uh, work done with uh, the businesses and agencies that uh, participated to um, assess uh, their views on uh, how valuable the process was. Uh, um, you've suggested that uh, there's a feeling of, of the importance of uh, carrying this on, but I'm, I'm just wondering what sort of feedback we got on a formal basis uh, that would inform that. Mm, that's a great question. So the uh, concluding of the EOTF was part of the five-point plan transition from CVEDS. So that work wasn't completed as part of CVEDS um, transition pr prior to C CVRD taking on that work. So we have not had any further further uh, engagement with the business community. Okay, so so the assessment that, uh, that the process was valuable is coming from where then? From the ERTF, the local governments. Okay, thanks. Director Hamir. Um, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to, to Lisa for the, the report. Um, you know, I, I I want to first of all note like how much has been done during COVID by most of the local governments here. Um, I think it's it's um, it, it's a it's a great summary of of all of the things that have happened um, since COVID. Um, my one question is I, I'm still having a I guess a hard time understanding um, if and how many of these things were actually as a result of the ERTF and if you know they were happening anyways or um, happened maybe despite. Um, I think during COVID, like especially 2020, I think there were many challenges with the ERTF and I, I just, I don't wanna um, 
gloss over them because um, if this were to happen again, if we have another emergency, I'm wondering if the ERTF model is actually the model that we want to go with forward. So I don't know if staff want to um, comment because I I saw you know some great um, organizational work done by the chamber. Um, I, I saw other organizations kind of stepping up and I didn't find that the ERTF really to be I mean, just as an outsider, not as someone who's on that group, I didn't find ERTF to be quite as effective as I was seeing elsewhere in the community. Yeah. Thanks for those um, observations. I think that certainly the uh, we can't speak to the the work that was done by CVETS. I think that there was a desire from what I've heard from the community uh, that there was a desire uh, potentially for further and deeper engagement with, with businesses and industry. I think that uh, the opportunity for local government to uh, get a sense of what some of those issues were and uh, I think was really important. I think that the uh, throughout the pandemic, people really and, and local governments uh, came together to address issues as they emerged. So attribution directly to EOTF is, is likely difficult. However, uh, definitely I, I think some, uh, some of the actions and, and the highlights uh, in, in the section under the six pillars that the ERTF uh, um, identified, uh, there are definitely um, direct actions there and, and certainly uh, around this board uh, from the CVRD perspective, letters that were submitted on behalf of the ERTF, I think were quite numerous there. I think that um, businesses did have some other ways to voice their needs as well, as you mentioned through through the, uh, the chambers and uh, other business, um, the downtown business associations. I think that um, it isn't a bad idea to reflect on, on what could happen next. Um, and if, if there were further, um, whether it's disaster recovery or uh, pandemic um, issues that arise for business, to look at the mechanisms that are in place for, um, for disaster recovery um, from the, the, the point of view from um, economic development and community economic development and business recovery. Yeah, I think um, I could add to that as well. I think some of the benefit was that, you know, we, we did reach out to quite a broad spectrum in all of these different industries beyond the chamber and beyond local business association um, to um, the agricultural industry, to the tech industry, uh, to the airport. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, we, we uh, had an opportunity to um, amplify um, a lot of those concerns that came out of there. One of those being childcare, which at the time uh, was not really considered an economic development problem, but it became very clear that it was an economic development problem from speaking with a number of industries that were struggling with um, having employees um, getting to work when, um, when the schools were closed. Um, so that's just you know one of the benefits that I saw um, from my perspective. Director Arbor? Yeah, I fully agree. I was going to talk about childcare too, because, you know, for me, it was incredibly serendipitous that the ERTF submitted their initial report. And there were two groups, one in Union Bay and one in Denman, that were looking to open new childcare spaces. And CVRD, within a month and a half, we had contribution agreements, which led to new childcare spaces being opened. So um, I thought, and, and, and it was born you have to remember the time too when that happened. Like we had such uncertainty whether the entire economy was going to collapse. Like we started this thing in April after uh, March, uh, the shutdown. There was such uncertainty, and we looked at the um, EDO's association, and they had this whole document on setting up economic uh, recovery task force, right? And and so that was stressful work. If you go back to the time, and I think what we ended up with is. Indeed, uh, good consultation with a lot of uh, different sector. We ended up with a patchwork of initiatives that reflected those priorities. So for example, that process led to, I think, all the jurisdiction writing a letter of support to the town of Comox for the Marine Services Building, which turned into a grant. Uh, so I think there's tangibles that come out 
Um, but this, you're right, in terms of post-mortem, this is a bit light today. I think the report was uh, bringing forward the spreadsheet, which to me actually doesn't tell a lot of stories we just referred to. I, I think there, there's richer stories that came out of it. So um, I, thought, I thought it was uh, a valid exercise and also ran its time. So time to fold it and, uh, and move forward with uh, what well, we know what we're moving forward with, with our different initiatives at the, in the different jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you. Director Morin. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I guess I'm sort of following the same the same theme that um, a lot of the the recommended actions are referred to, you know, uh, CVRD or Courtney or whatever, and we're not really getting a a picture of um, of those. Oh, like it's a report on on the um, the plan and and what was envisioned, but not really we don't we can't really tell what what the result was of of that per se so um i understand what you're saying that 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 was a piece that was at the end that that didn't get completed but it's yeah it's just i guess it's sort of let's just wrap it up and kind of move on but um um yeah that's i guess i've got a similar comment to the rest of the group so far thanks thank you Dr. Grieve. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, as you said, it was uh, it, all over the map. Um, if any of us around the table had a chance to read the raw data as it came in from all the stakeholders, it was quite diverse. <laughs> and some of it was uh, a little bit out there. I mean, we we're in the middle of COVID, and, uh, you know, but, but I think what was really appreciated was the fact that we did go out and ask the community, you know, what they saw as a way through it. And I don't know if that's ever been done before. I don't think we've done that before. And, and obviously it was, you know, as I say, very diverse all over the place. And, and I guess they did their best to, to boil it down to what you see now as the action plan. But, you know, I want staff to plug their ears for a second here, but I think we, being an ad hoc committee like that, I think that we got an awful lot done I guess in spite of the fact the staff wasn't there. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Director Hillian. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, so uh, I, I think it's difficult to uh, separate uh, our assessment of this process from um, the uh, uh, somewhat uh, difficult circumstances of the CBEDS uh, process. Um, and, um, you know, looking back on it, um, to me, it, had we had um, a fully functioning economic development uh, society that had the confidence of a broad cross-section of the community, I think that uh, the process would have been different. Um, but as it was, uh, I think we made the best with what we had. And I really want to acknowledge the work that our staff did under those uh, very difficult uh, circumstances uh, to, to support and, and uh, facilitate the process. Uh, the other thing, I, I think that um, Director Hamir uh, um, acknowledged the work of the Chamber of Commerce, which um, I think uh, proves a lesson to us that uh, when there are organizations in the community that uh, have an established uh, and strong working relationship with the business community, that that's a natural ally. And um, um, as, as part of our ongoing um, engagement and partnerships, I think we need to be aware of, of where those allies are and who we can turn to uh, to work effectively in, in times of uh, a crisis, which is what we were in. And uh, the conflict we had in relation to not having a solid uh, um, consensus of support with CBEDS, I think, proved to be a major obstacle that uh, um, hopefully uh, we will we will not see that uh, in the future. Uh, it's it's likely we're going to have other circumstances like this where we're going to have to respond. And, and uh, I think having those strong community partnerships and, and putting time and energy into maintaining them is crucial. Thanks. I agree. Thank you. Uh, Director Hermier. Great. Thanks. Um, some really good, rich discussion. So thanks to the directors for, for chiming in. Um, so I'm hearing that the, you know, one of the 
big benefits for him putting the ERTF together was actually hearing from the community and and just want to echo you know with uh, with what uh, director Hillian just said if that's one of the really important pieces of um, of what of the takeaway um, you know having those allies like the chamber like the BIAs and, and having those relationships in place um, I think will allow us to get that information so much faster. Because I, if I recall, that was one of the impediments early on was finding the people to be representatives and to to feed into the ER, ERTF. Um, I don't recall seeing all of the raw data, and that was maybe one of the issues that we had early on that I think only the chairs may have um, had access to the raw data. So sharing um, raw data with elected officials, I think, is, is one of the things that would have been really helpful so that we could see those stories and we can tease them out. Um, so gathering of information and then also, yes, we didn't really have a great structure of how what do we do with this information now? How do we enact? How do we change? We got some um, fairly substantial funding from the province. And I think we had enough information from the community, possibly through ERTF and through others that we were able to direct the funding to food hubs, food security, childcare, and, and all of those. But it may, it could have probably been much more streamlined and, and a little bit more um, focused. Uh, it kind of happened. This, despite or maybe help with, but um, yeah, I think we made it through. Um, but I always wish, you know, I want to always learn from our, um, you know, putting things like these together. So just hoping that we can build a, you know, a better, better system in place next time. Thanks, uh, Lisa, you have any follow up to that or are you good? Okay, that's good, thank you. I don't see any further lights on. So we're on receipt. All in favor of receipt. Anyone opposed? That's carried. Hillian and Arbor, thank you. And it's the vote of the area is Courtney Comox. And any further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried, thank you. We're on to item six, 2022 local government elections. <laughs> Coleman Grant, thank you. And I'll pass it to staff. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, directors, there's an election. This is an election year. And uh, Jake Martins, our uh, general manager of uh, corporate services is here to uh, describe the report and the resolutions that are required in order to conduct the election. Thank you, Russell, and through the chair, yes, it is hard to believe that nearly four years has passed. Um, time has certainly marched on, uh, but nonetheless, here we are. Uh, this report uh, really uh, sets out a few key resolutions that we're seeking from the board to formalize some of our election planning and uh, coordination. Uh, those key pieces are the appointment of the chief and deputy chief election officers, uh, the ex execution of the uh, election services agreements with Islands Trust and School District uh, 71, and finally, uh, a, a very small amendment to the CVRD election bylaw to remove the conditions uh, which electors were required to meet in order to vote by mail. Those conditions have been repealed by the province, and so therefore they're repealed by us as well. So uh, that uh, th those are the three items. Uh, the amendment to the election bylaw is required to be made by July the 4th, 2022, in order to apply to the October elections. So we've got lots of time, but nonetheless uh, want to check off a few of these key pieces now. Uh, and with that, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Great. Thanks, Jake. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, I just wanted to be cheeky and say that Jake seems to have a lot of enthusiasm about the next election, <laughs> and I don't really know what that's about, but I've never seen him so excited. <laughs> it's exciting stuff. Okay. Just sorry, he was equally as excited about policy, you'll remember that too. <laughs> this is Jake's thing. Yeah. Easily amused. <laughs> Director Arbor. You won't laugh so much because I, I would like to propose that staff be also submit, subjected to elections and that uh, we waive for elected officials uh, the election and we just carry on with our work. <laughs> Switch it up a bit. Okay, so we're on receipt. I don't see any questions. So let's vote the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. There's a recommendation. 
Grant and Arbor, we have recommendation one. Any further discussion? Again, a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. Second. Arbor and Morin, thank you. We have recommendation two. Any further discussion? And again, vote the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. I'll ask now how the board's doing. I know there were a number of meetings leading up to this meeting. So would you care for a five minute? <laughs> okay, we'll come back at 528. That's why it's not quarter eight yet.
Okay, call everybody back to the table. So we left off at bylaws and resolutions for first and second reading. So first we have bylaw number 683, the Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw. That's the Layton Saratoga Speedway. Can I get a first and second? Arbor and Grant, thank you. And it's a vote of the areas. Everyone at the table. Oh, Director Hamir, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll continue to vote against this um, as I did at electoral areas. Um, um, I didn't feel that uh, the, the uh, proposal going forward really met the needs of the community as already presented. Um, I realized that that community has a chance to now um, go forward and, and say so in front of um, a public hearing, but um, sadly, I wish that we could have pr provided the community with a better um, proposal. Thank you. Director Grief, go ahead. Well, I'd like to refute that because we have heard from um, a select few loud voices from the community, but what we need to hear from are the quiet voices in the community. And as such, I think it's important we go to public hearing so we can hear from everyone. And who knows, I mean, we'll get some new ideas out of that, that we will, you know, be able to bring back and maybe we'll have to uh, rescind the bylaw and, and bring it back to public hearing again. But at the end of the day, we want to get it right. The status quo is unattainable because uh, the status quo allows the uh, racetrack to run as is without any, any controls. So I think it's important that we uh, use this opportunity through the zoning to, uh, to actually see if we can get somewhere where there's uh, at least a compromise where we can get uh, a win-win uh, or maybe a lose-lose, but uh, so that we can have something that's balanced in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hamir? If I could just ask staff to clarify, um, I didn't see any controls um, in the proposal moving forward around the racing, timing, um, days of operation. So, um, is there a way of, of implementing that without um, voting the proposal down? Is So if, if staff could just. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll ask uh, Alana Malayli, General Manager of Planning and Development to come forward and answer that question. Thank you, Russell. Through Madam Chair to the directors, I think you know that the suggestion is that when a when a use has non-conforming status, our ability to regulate it uh, to a different standard than than what it's operating under is limited. And so, by recognizing a use in the zoning, we can use the tools that are afforded through zoning. So, landscaping setbacks those pieces. On the noise piece and nuisance, those are separate, as you know, separate regulatory bylaws, and they we would need to regulate through those bylaws, rather than trying to address noise through a land use bylaw. So you've given us a direction through the EASC to come back to you and, and talk about our noise bylaw, and, and we're working towards doing that prior to the public hearing. Thanks, Lana. Director Arbor. Yeah, I think so far the process is kind of working. We're teasing out concerns. We have an application from uh, somebody who wants to do something different on their property. Um, the community has already stepped up with concerns and suggestions, not only on noise, but on nuisance, environmental concerns, water concerns. And what happened to the local area plan that was never uh, ratified? You know, when I was elected, I thought the sustainability strategy was like one of the key documents on the board. And six months into it, I learned that it was never ratified by the board. So, I mean, there's, those are all significant issues. And I'm sure the local area plan is also uh, something. But in terms of doing due process with the applicant, I haven't seen anything yet that suggests that, uh, that we should not move to public hearing, as I said last time, in order to hear um, from everybody. And, and to understand how that relates to the, the other topics at hand. And after the public hearing, we'll come to a decision on the, on the application. So if we always waited for all the other pieces of work to cut into play, 
you know, there would, there would always be more like, you know, I think uh, in every issue that we deal with, there's always other pieces that I wish had been done before. So with that, I'll vote in favor of going to public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any further lights. Again, so both the areas, all in favor? Any opposed? Amir opposed, thank you. That's carried. And we're on to bylaws for first, second, and third reading. We have bylaw number 702, the Comox Valley Economic Development Service Conversion Bylaw. Killian and Grant for our first and second. And it's a vote with a full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. <laughs> Everybody's mouthful. Um, Hilly and, and Grant on third reading. Again, vote full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. We're on to item three which is bylaw number 703, Comox Valley Tourism Service Capital Reserve Fund Establishment Bylaw. Grant and Hanier for first and second. And it's a vote of the areas, Courtney and Comox. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. Move third. Cole Hamilton and Grant move third. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. We're on to item four. Uh, bylaw number 705, Comox Valley Tourism Service Future Expenditure Reserve Fund Establishment Bylaw. <laughs> In unison. Uh, Helene and Grant, thank you. And again, some of the areas, Courtney Comox, all in favor? Anyone opposed? That is carried. Arbor and Hillian move third. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. And that brings us to new business. We have the electoral area boundaries correspondence from Director Arbor. Grant, Grant and Hamir, thank you. And Director Arbor, would you like to speak to this? Thank you. I think we are so caught up in regional district world that the title that occurred to me this weekend should be electoral district boundaries, um, but that's okay. Uh, so the, both the province and the federal government have now moved to electoral district terminology. Used to be riding at the federal level and constituency at the provincial, but now they use electoral district. So. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm actually hoping to generate some dialogue on it uh, in our correspondence at the end of March or beginning of March. We got a letter that the province every eight years or every two elections rather um, reconsiders the boundaries. In 2015, there was a significant uh, adjustment in the Comox Valley. So you probably, I wasn't, I, I was in the Comox Valley. Geez, I was on the islands. I didn't feel like I was in the Comox Valley. But uh, you probably remember Don McCray in the, the Comox Valley um, Electoral District provincially that, that basically had all of our jurisdictions together. And in 2015, due to uh, principally um, numbers, um, there was a redistricting process. And despite objections from the Comox Valley, um, the valley was split in that Cumberland and Area A joined the new uh, Electoral District of Mid-Island Pacific Rim, which includes Benfield and Tofino and Esquiet and um, part of Nanaimo Regional District. And the rest of the area stayed in Courtney Comox, which is the rest of you. So other than Cumberland and I, um, all of you are in Courtney Comox. So the consideration is whether um, we want to advocate for the reestablishment of the Comox Valley Electoral District um, and my little report talks a little bit about the pros and cons in it. And since then, I've talked to a couple of people involved with the process um, that are in the process section. And their feedback is um, the Comox Valley is not at issue. Uh, they think that it makes for a nice little tidy uh, electoral district. The problem is Mid-Island Pacific Rim, that they feel that the number of people that would uh, be left in that district may be problematic. They would drop to 40,000, 42,000. 
Um, so if we were to, um, I mean, I think unfortunately I made up my mind in the process of, of researching this, so I, I, I can try to skew you, but that's not the job here. I'm trying to get feedback because what I heard too is that the only way this is going to work and there's, if, if we wanted a change is that the whole region would have to kind of speak in favor of that because I think any opportunity um, to, to uh, if any of the jurisdiction were saying that they're happy with the status quo, then that would probably give excuse to the province to just uh, move along. So, um, so if you want the status quo, then you just have to raise your hand. And if your jurisdictions want that, that's probably what's going to happen. But I thought I'd test it out because they're coming on March 24th for preliminary uh, hearing from the community in Courtney at 12 p.m. at the Best Western. And I've registered for that. Mayor Baird is also registered to come and speak for Cumberland. Um, I've had a quick touch base with the two mayors, Mayor Arnott and, and uh, Mayor Wells. There seems to be um, general support for the concept of trying to advocate for the Comox Valley. So I'll open it up to uh, thoughts from the board because ultimately what I said to the commission is that we could either bring you through the chair or a delegate the CBRD board's <laughs> opinion as an institution if there was a motion or we could just, you know, I could just go as area A and and do like uh, Mayor Baird will do. Thanks. Thank you. Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. And uh, was I mistaken or did you not reference uh, Mayor Baird? Uh, uh, oh, okay. Because um, obviously the, uh, the views of Cumberland are, are fairly central to this. Um, First of all, uh, thanks uh, very much for uh, for the effort. Uh, it's uh, I think you you produced a, a good uh, um, letter. Um, I have a couple of minor editorial suggestions that I, I'm happy to send to you later on, um, just ar around readability. Having taken a plain language course uh, uh, last week that confirmed all of my <laughs> ideas about such things, <laughs> I'm not the aging relic that I thought I was in that regard. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, I, I, um, I actually think that uh, it's in our interest uh, to restore the uh, electoral district uh, to its old boundaries as the Comox Valley. I'd be prepared to move a resolution uh, to that effect uh, subsequent to receipt of, of this uh, so that you could in incorporate that into the, uh, um, the message. And, um, uh, you know, my, my, I don't. I don't know how uh, Cumberland feels about that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that they would be in agreement uh, because uh, basically they opposed uh, being hived off uh, and part of uh, Pacific Rim in the first place. Um, I think you made a really good point in your uh, arguments that um, size doesn't necessarily matter or population size um, because there are other factors and and, uh, and and of course there are precedents in other parts of the province and and whether the Comox Valley and the Alberni region have more or less population than other ridings, I really don't see what difference it makes. Um, you know, the, perhaps um, any inequities in relation to size of population, which obviously generates more files to be dealt with, could be addressed uh, through uh, uh, the size of the constituency support that's provided. Um, I think oftentimes uh, the, the challenges of getting around a, a large uh, a geographically diverse area like Pacific Rim uh, could be offset by having less population to deal with, whereas um, it's it's easier for somebody to represent a riding like this when it's essentially uh, all within uh, you know twenty minutes, half an hour drive of uh, of, uh, of each other. So, um, but I think the main issue is that uh, our interest as local government in being able to effectively deal with the provincial government is facilitated if we're only dealing with one MLA as opposed to two, regardless of whether one of them is in cabinet or not, and. Um, uh, I think that's something that um, makes it in our interest to support the restoration uh, as such. Thanks. Thanks, Director. And, and yeah, maybe I'll just speak on behalf of Cumberland. And I, I did um, present at the last Electoral Boundaries Commission, um, but Mayor Baird will be doing it this time. But we have um, spoken in council about, um, you know, the re reduced service level that we receive um, or our constituents receive um, in um, having the main office in Port Alberni 
uh, constituency office of our MLA as, as opposed to in Courtney. Um, and, and that is quite a disadvantage for us. Um, and we also happen to have um, the last um, two MLAs also be ministers, which means they are even less available to us um, uh, as uh, representatives of the community than, than normal. Um, so it's, it's very much um, our feeling that, that Cumberland would benefit from being part of the, the Valley um, area again. Director Hamir. Thanks, Chair. I mean, it's good to hear that. Um, I guess when when you're par part of the valley that deals with the MLA whose office is here in downtown, you forget. And, and I didn't realize that there wasn't office hours locally here. So um, absolutely travel travel time and, and having to go to Port Alberni to see your MLA. I mean, um, sometimes it is nice to have two advocates at, at the provincial table um, kind of rooting for your valley. But I think um, the benefits of having just one, bringing uh, Cumberland Area A into the fold, um, culturally, I mean, not just the fact that Comox First Nation, that this is the full territory, but also I think just, um, you know, as um, a community, we're, we're culturally more aligned than probably Cumberland is with uh, with Pacific Rim, so it just makes more sense to have everybody um, together. So I would fully support a resolution, um, a motion, if that was brought forward. Thank you, Dr. McCollum. Yeah, I just wanted to express my support for what's um, been outlined in the report. I mean, the arguments are very sound and very much in line with, I think, how we all see the challenges of having two MLAs um, to represent the region. And um, I mean, I, I remember the disappointment in, in the area when this was decided. And I mean, those challenges really haven't changed. They've been probably exacerbated in the meantime, um, just with the realities of, of how um, elections unfold here. And um, really we haven't even experienced um, the scenario in which we have to um, address our issues with two MLAs from two different parties, um, which if that were to happen, it would add further complexity and um, challenges for us in, from a communication standpoint. So uh, hopefully this um, feedback is well received and considered by the commission. Director Grant. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't disagree with what everybody's saying. Unfortunately, we haven't brought this up at our council table yet. So you're asking us to make a call for them. And, and I would be a lot, uh, I'd feel a lot better about it if we got the chance to talk to them about it first. So that we just like, you guys have pretty much had your conversation. We haven't even addressed it in any way. So I would ask that we put this off till after we get a chance to have a sit down with our council. And then, and I don't think anybody's going to change the, change the outcome, but it's, you know, just seems to me like we should give them the opportunity to. Yeah, I think all the councils were sent um, the information on the, um, the change and the opportunity to, for a submission. Dr. Hillian. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't believe we meet again until the 29th of March, and uh, the presentation is on the 24th. But I wonder if um, if uh, a compromise would be that um, we pass a resolution subject to uh, the decision of Comarch's Council, which would be communicated to us in the interim after uh, Directors Grant and Swift have had a chance to speak with them. Director Arbor. I may propose a, a different slant on this, which is, as we know, we all wear two hats at this table. Um, so I think what my sense is, is if this is going to be successful, it's not a uh, show of support from the CVRD board that will make the day. It will be a show of support from the CVRD board, from the town of Comox, from the village of Cumberland, from um, the city of Courtney, and from the ESC, from all of us, all sending in letters and expressions. And, and what I'm saying is, if Town of Comox, for some reason, decided that they're not supportive, I think they, their letter could kill the process right then and there. But what I'm trying to say is, today, we have the opportunity to wear our CVRD hat 
And what I'm asking you to consider is as a region and as board members of the regional district, do you think it is in uh, the Comox Valley Regional District's favor to have a single MLA representing the Comox Valley versus two? So I, I, I would still, unless uh, the two Comox directors really feel strongly against, I would still like, because otherwise I'll just go as area A next week, right? Uh, so to me as a board, it, 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 uh, I'm sure you can, if you're able to put on your CVRD hat, <laughs> even though you're from the different jurisdictions, because I actually may have a different view if I put my Hornby hat on. We've benefited <laughs> from our current MLA quite stupendously. So, uh, but I'm really bringing my regional hat on to this discussion today. Thank you. Director Swift. Thank you. Um, I think I'm happy voting in favor of this because um, I, I haven't heard anybody think, say they thought it was a good idea. Um, I, anywhere in town, anywhere in the valley, it always seemed a really awkward arrangement. And uh, we do have a, a council meeting tomorrow, which we could confirm uh, the conversation, but uh, I'm fairly certain we would all be in agreement on this. Okay, Director Hillian. Yeah, if we can dispense with receipt, I, I have a resolution to propose. All right, all in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? That's carried, go ahead. I move that the uh, Comox Valley Regional District Board um, endorse the promotion of restoring the Comox Valley as a single provincial electoral district and support uh, Director Arbor in his presentation to the commission as such. Seconded by Morris. Any further discussion? Director Arbor. I, I, I'm speaking in favor, but I just want, um, I did write in my letter if, if the chair wanted to the, the presentation representing the board, obviously that would be the proper protocol, but otherwise I'm willing to stand in as well. I'm happy to do it, but I think that you're you're <laughs> more capable and you've come up with the letter and put forward the initiative. I think that it's appropriate for you to submit and and present. Okay, so it's a vote of full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. <laughs> Okay, so we have new business, the public hearing for bylaw number 683 regarding the Saratoga Speedway. Oops. Grant and Arbor, thank you. And does staff want to speak to this? Um, I think the, the report is self-explanatory and we have the recommendation required to establish the public hearing, which will require you to fill out the various positions. Uh, staff are available to answer any questions if you have any. Okay. Any questions for staff? Okay, I don't see any. It's, um, we're on receipt. And it's above the areas. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried and there's a recommendation. Grant and Arbor, thank you. Right. So there needs to be a discussion on item number four in the recommendation. Directors from the areas, designated chair, first chair, or first vice chair and second vice chair. Director Arbor. Thank you. I would like to nominate Director Grieve to be chair of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, myself as uh, the second, and Dr. Amiris, the third. Okay, seconded by Amir. All right, any further discussion? Okay, again, it's about the areas, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And we move. Thank you, I guess. <laughs> so we move on. We have uh, an addendum, and we'll Hillian and Barbara moving that the addendum be considered. 
All in favor? Anyone opposed? That is carried. And so the addendum is the Electoral Areas Service Committee um, grant applications. Amir and Grant, thank you. Oh yeah, there's no, no recommendation. Oh yes, that is the recommend, yes. Sorry. Well, yes, you, so there, well, now that we've done the seat, we'll just <laughs> call the question on a receipt, all in favor. Anyone opposed? That's carried. Arbor and Grant have moved the recommendation, and that's that we apply to the federal and provincial um, grants for the Lazo Greenway Trail and the Denman Island Cross Island Trail. Director Grief. Well, this would be absolutely amazing if they both went ahead. So um, I'm just wondering. Um, when when is the uh, outcome of the when would the outcome of the application come back? Do we have I'll any idea? Just ask uh, Doug DeMarzo to come forward and answer your questions, General Manager of uh, Community Services. Thank you. And through the chair, we're expecting uh, the outcome, although there's no determined date, to be this summer for the federal grant and then build on that with a provincial grant uh, process. So um, sometime this year for both grants. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Okay. So both the areas, all in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. And that's it for this agenda. There's no in camera. No in camera. So it's just termination, grant, and grief. Thank you. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Thank you. <laughs>